If you like the video make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. For more videos like this, people, what are the strangest and most terrifying paranormal sightings you've experienced that still give you the creeps? About two years ago, I went to the house to sit for my grandma while she went on vacation. Average house. It has a basement, used to do laundry, other than that, it's never used, and an upstairs with three bedrooms, grandma had four kids. It was midnight, and I was watching TV in the living room when I heard some creaking. It was an older house, so I thought nothing of it. And then, all of a sudden, I could have sworn I heard my grandma call for me. I thought this was weird because she's on vacation for a week, and this is my second day there. Ten minutes pass, and I hear it again. I go to the basement door, and at the bottom of the steps, I see my grandma. But what's more horrifying is that her mouth was wide open and her eyes were black. I couldn't move. Seconds went by, and all of a sudden the figure started sprinting up the steps. I managed to close and lock the door. I heard one big thud and nothing else after. I looked through the keyhole and saw nothing. I couldn't call the cops because I knew it was a ghost. I didn't tell my grandma because I didn't want to freak her out. A year goes by, and I finally tell my grandma about my experience. She looked shocked and then explained to me that her sister fell down those stairs years ago and died. She's heard creaking but never seen her presence. My grandma hired people to move her washer and dryer from the basement, and she locked and closed that door forever. A few nights ago, my dog died, which I had had for 10 years. We had him cremated. The day we received the urn back from where he was cremated. We noticed a few things moved around that house that shouldn't have moved. The second night, I was asleep in my bedroom with the room door open, and my dog, who's still with us, was frightened by something and started to growl and bark towards the door. Every night since then, he randomly gets out of bed, barking super aggressively and growling as if he sees something he doesn't like. What can we do to get rid of whatever is in the house? Is it possible something was attached to the urn and followed back home with us? I'm religious, and so is my wife. What should we do? When I was about 16 years old, we lived in an older house that had a rather large basement. We owned a cat and typically left her in the basement with the door shut at night because that was where her litter box was. I was sleeping on the couch one night and was startled awake by the cat jumping on my chest. I thought it was a bit strange that the cat was out, but I just reasoned that someone had forgotten to shut the basement door or had forgotten to put her down there. I got up with the cat in hand, walked to the basement, and opened the basement door. The next thing I saw I can only describe as a faint green glow that was enveloping the entire basement, as if a dim green bulb were lit up in one of the far corners. Suddenly, I felt a very strange sensation. I can really only say that it felt as if a moving vibration passed through my entire body. I then got very scared and tried to shut the basement door, but something was actively resisting my shutting of the door. I then let go of the knob and ran upstairs to wake up my parents and tell them what had happened. To this day, it's the strangest thing that has ever happened to me. My mom recently told me of an encounter she had with a paranormal being when she was living with her mom, my grandma. When she was in her teens, going into her 20s, she was walking down the stairs and happened to peek into the study room, which could be seen from the stairs. What she described was a figure who looked like he was trying to pretend he was a bird. He had a black suit on and a giant mass of feathers on him. He had a deformed, bird-shaped head and was hunched over on a couch in the corner of the study. She said it tilted its head, looked at her, spun, and flew off into another room. I need help identifying what or who the entity was. So my friends live in the deep woods of North Carolina. The land they live on has always felt very off. You do not want to be on that property by yourself. It doesn't matter if it's day or night. Me and multiple people have seen this same creature. It is tall, skinny, pale in color, and has white antlers. It hides behind trees and seems to blend in with the tree line. When we see it, it is always at night. It also makes you feel dread when you see it. In the woods around this house, it is almost like everything is either dead silent or making too many sounds at once, like rustling in the trees, leaves being stepped on, etc. Out of all of the times we have seen this creature, we can only compare it to a mix of a high behind and a wendigo. The other thing is that we feel that whatever this creature is, it is influencing us from inside the house as well. The front door they have has a glass window in the middle of it, which is opaque. You can't see through it perfectly, but you can tell if someone or something is outside. Anyways, we have all been too scared to open the door when this happens, but sometimes in the middle of the night, we can see something white moving quickly in front of the front door from inside. We also hear footsteps on the other side of the house, among other issues. I'm wondering if this is from this same creature influencing the inside of the house. Anyway, this thing is really freaking us out, but when we try looking up things like this, we cannot find anything similar at all. 
I have consistently been dealing with something or someone calling my name out. Oftentimes, it wakes me up, but at other times, I am fully conscious. It is always one of three voices. My husband's voice, my father's voice, or a completely unknown, unfamiliar voice. I will be home alone, and I will hear my name called out. I'll be asleep and awakened to someone calling my name. No one is there. On a side note, my family has told me they have heard me in the house when I am not home. And on one occasion, my husband and I clearly heard my dad call my name outside the door. Yet he was sound asleep downstairs. Those are only a few situations. But it's so often these days that I just don't know. Saying my name is as clear as day. I'd be more than interested in thoughts or sharing a more broad background, but this is the nutshell for this particular issue. I am not at all unfamiliar with the paranormal realm or hauntings. I have dealt with it since I was a kid. I believe this is related. My mother has been followed from home to home throughout her entire life by an entity that is mischievous and sometimes very dark. She's become used to it over the years, but she will still leave the house from time to time if things get too chaotic. Not being able to get out of a room, doors not opening with resistance holding the knob, things missing, then showing up where you looked five minutes prior, this includes her prescription bottles. The last disturbing episode was when she was awoken in her sleep by a dark figure standing next to her bed with reddish eyes. She got up and slowly moved to the other side of her king-size bed, which was as warm as if someone had been sleeping all night on that side. She has also been visited quite often by family members who have passed on, who literally show up at any time of the day and say something to her. Footsteps at night constantly, she puts something in front of her bedroom if she gets freaked out. Growing up, I have seen only a few occurrences, but it's a daily thing for her. From a young age, I've always suspected a presence around the house. I never really thought much of it, and my mom always dismissed me as paranoid. These days, she agrees with me that something is definitely going on. With that being said, both my mom and sister have encountered the same ghost. My mom tells a story of a man in a top hat who stood by her bedside, bowed his head to her, then swooshed away into the mirror. My sister, years later, told a similar story about a man in a top hat watching her in our old room. They'd never discussed this before, so it was a big shock once they both told their stories, as I'm pretty sure it was the same ghost. My sister also had a friend with a gift, as she described it, and supposedly saw two kids hiding in our built-in shared bedroom wardrobe. None of us thought much of this until my mom's friend came by and described seeing the exact same thing. Down to the details, she described the same thing, a boy and a girl hiding in our wardrobe. Weird, right? I, on the other hand, never had such experiences apart from weird things happening to me. When I was younger, I used to constantly hear music coming from beneath the floors, which is odd as we are in a basement flat and the floor is solid concrete underneath the floorboards. Or I'd constantly find myself falling downstairs after feeling as if I'd be pushed but was dismissed and labeled as a klutz. I also had this weird sense that I was being watched all the time, seriously, I used to make my parents escort me to the toilet and make them sit outside because I had this eerie feeling that something was watching me, and because of all my clumsy accidents, I didn't feel safe. As well as this, my stuff would always go missing. It was weird, and for years I felt like a scatterbrain because no matter where I left things, they would never be there. For years, I've been experiencing this, whether it be with my phone, my keys, a trinket, or a toy. It would disappear and reappear in the most odd places where I knew I definitely had not left it. Well, now it started happening to my mom, and she finally believes me. My sister finally moved out, so it's just the two of us, and her stuff has somehow grown legs and wandered off too. Very, very weird. Anyone experienced a similar thing? I've had multiple, but there is one that creeps me out the most. I've had a shadow person follow me throughout my life. The only time I remember seeing it was when I was in my old bedroom upstairs, meaning not in the basement. I was around 7 to 8 years old, and in the middle of the night, I woke up and looked at my window, which had blinds and was illuminated by the moon. In front of the window, however, was a black silhouette of a little girl with what looked like short, curly hair almost old-timey looking. I was terrified and thought I was seeing things, so I just rolled over and tried to go back to sleep. The door was open when I woke up. I asked my parents if they came into my room, and they said they didn't. Although I haven't seen it again, my friends have. A couple months or so after I had seen it, I had a sleepover with my friend at the time, still in the same room. We had slept on the floor because my bed was too small for the both of us. In the middle of the night, my friend woke up and saw that there was a dark shadow man standing over me and just staring down at me while I was sleeping. She told me this when we woke up in the morning, and I noticed my door had been opened. 
I just figured it was one of my parents checking on us, so I asked both my parents if they came into the room, and they both said no. Years later, I moved into my sister's room, downstairs in the basement, after she moved out. I was 16 to 17 and had forgotten about the shadow person at this point. My best friend spent the night, and she told me in the morning that she saw a shadow figure standing in the corner of the room. At first, I didn't believe her until I remembered the two incidents that happened almost a decade prior. I didn't tell either of them about the shadow person's story or stories until after they told me that they saw it. I'm 19 now and haven't had any incidents, that I know of, since. Ten-ish years ago, I lived in a village surrounded by forests, fields, and mountains. We had just a main road, and almost all houses aligned along with it, aside from a few newer ones. They built a complete side street with a dead end for these houses, that dead end stopped right in front of a forest. So there is nothing incredible and even less to do. I spent most of my free days either at home gaming or down in the valley. So, I had to take the bus back then every single day because the new side street was at such a weird angle that they put a mirror on the opposite side of it so cars could see if there was another car approaching. I walked up to the bus station like always, still early in the morning, and suddenly saw something large and black in the mirror. It surprised me because I hadn't heard a truck or anything when I turned around, but there was nothing on the side street. I thought I was just tired because I woke up just half an hour ago. A few days later, I took a stroll to clear my head. I thought I could walk up that side street into the forest, looking at the new houses, how much they've finished some of them, and if it's still as scenic as before. It didn't take long to get to the dead end. I saw the forest and thought it was sad that it seemed so weird with the new modern houses right along with this old village and beautiful fields and woods. I took a breather, let it all sink in, and turned around. Just after a few steps, I heard a growl from the woods. I know how the animals in our forest sound. I know that we have no wolves here and that the biggest predatory animals here are foxes. And that growl sounded like nothing I've ever heard. I turned around and saw something dark in the woods, just a shadow or something, and it was hard to tell if I just imagined it out of fear or not. It took me a few seconds until I realized that everything was back to normal and there was no shadow in sight. I never experienced something like that ever again, I moved a few months later and never asked if someone else heard or experienced that. I was walking in the woods behind my house when I saw something strange. I had already spent the last 6 or 7 years cutting out trails with my machete. I liked walking the trails when I got home from work. It was like my personal walking path and still is, but not so often these days. The woods are mostly old growth, nothing exceptional but natural beauty, no old homesteads, though I did find an old rusty spur, old wagon and plow parts, a gilt button, lots of gun shells, and oddly a swastika on a rusty piece of metal with my metal detector, all in different places mostly. It's like a little paradise. Anyway, I was walking this one day and stopped cold as a black man with short hair and a white t-shirt ducked behind a big pine tree some 30 feet from me. I just froze there on the trail, staring at the tree. In the second that followed, up the pine tree, a wild egret or such bird with a large wingspan burst upward and disappeared in the canopy. But I kept my eyes on the tree because the man was still there. I moved slowly in a wide circle around the tree and around and walked low and slow towards the tree because there was no one there, but there was a depression in the ground there covered in vines, that whole part of the woods is covered in muscadine and wild grapevines. No one was there. I was left so bewildered. I was so certain someone was there. When I was a kid, maybe between the ages of 11 and 13, I became really fascinated with my grandpa. However, I had never known him, as he passed away before I was born. I would talk to him frequently. I believed he was listening. One day, I was over at my uncle's house with my cousin, the daughter of my uncle. It was just the two of us. We were kids, but old enough at that point to be left alone. We were in her room, and I was telling her about what I had been doing to contact grandpa. She's younger than me, so she also never knew him. The two of us started talking out loud to him, as I often did when I was alone. In typical cliche child fashion, we asked him to give us a sign if he was with us. The bedroom door was completely closed. No windows were open. No breeze. No draft. The doorknob turned and the door opened, only to reveal no one on the other side who would have opened it. I am 29 years old and an amateur historian with a lifelong fascination for paranormal stuff, and exploring the remotest corners of the Bavarian countryside has become a frequent pastime. I recently started to document and share my experiences with anomalous sites and strange occurrences while traversing these historically significant lands under the veil of darkness. The Entersburg in particular held notable legends of occult mysteries and visitations from beyond, dating back to medieval times. Its primeval pine forests were said to conceal mysteries that modern eyes were not meant to see. 
but as dusk deepened, the twisting trail disappeared into the gathering gloom beneath the ancient trees. Disoriented, I pulled out my phone to check the map, only to find the battery dead. I had foolishly allowed my equipment to fail out here in the wilderness alone. Lost to my hubris, night was closing in fast as I struggled through the dense undergrowth, desperately seeking any signpost back to civilization. That was when a figure materialized out of the shadows directly ahead. I froze in place, my heart leaping into my throat at the sight of the spectral silhouette flickering at the edge of my vision between the tree trunks. As my eyes adjusted to the low light, details emerged of a tall man with a wild brown beard and piercing blue eyes. He was dressed in coarse linen clothes, unlike any I had ever seen, and in clumsy shoes caked in dirt. The man stared at me intently, his brows furrowed in obvious confusion. For an extended moment, we simply gaped at one another across the gloaming forest floor, some unspoken tension crackling in the air between us. Finally, he broke the silence. What year is this? He asked curtly in German-accented English, his inflection laced with a tone of urgency, as if waking from a long dream. Too perplexed to form a coherent response, I could only continue gaping at his anachronistic appearance, every rational part of my mind rejecting what I was witnessing. He took a step closer, his ghostly, pale features taut with mounting concern. You must tell me the year, he demanded, raising a calloused hand as if to grab my shoulders. Somehow I managed to emerge onto an open valley road as full night descended, staggering onto the asphalt path with flagging strength and a parched throat. Still reeling from my uncanny encounter, I began the long walk back down the mountain towards the nearest civilization, replaying the bizarre incident over and over in my mind. Who or what was that man I saw materialize from the shadows, so dislocated from this time? And how did he disappear, as if whisked away by some inexplicable force? Left troubled but determined, I knew this wasn't a mystery I could leave unsolved. As my channel seeks to explore the improbable realities lurking around us, perhaps within this primordial Untersberg forest lies another strange tale from obscured history, waiting for illumination. I was 17, living in Iceland. One day, my father decided to bring me along to visit my sister, who was living with her boyfriend. On that day, I woke up in the middle of the night sweating and feeling strangely cold. I tried to go to sleep, but I kept hearing weird sounds every few minutes. It was like hearing tea cups or glass cups clicking together, always three times. I tried to ignore it, but then I heard the door open. I was panicking, and in fear, I couldn't open my eyes. I felt it so much that something was standing before me. I suddenly became very cold and shook in fear, but then it suddenly disappeared, and a few seconds later I heard scratching under my bed, right where my head would be. I was so panicked and still couldn't trust myself to open my eyes. I was so certain there was something near, but then it disappeared. I tried to sleep, but in fear, I kept awake until everyone woke up. I still remember the scratching today, five years later, and it still gives me chills. My parents live on around 140 acres of woodland in central Missouri. One night, my brother, his buddy Joe, my wife, and I were having a few beers and a bonfire this past October and just started talking about how creepy it was that night. My brother and Joe, who are now in their early 20s, told us about a time when they went hunting, I think they were 16 or so, got turned around, and ended up getting lost in the woods at dusk. They said it was almost dark when a huge black dog crossed their path. They said they didn't see or hear it come close, and the thing was too massive to miss. The dog had glowing yellow eyes and never let them get more than 20 or so feet near them. They followed the dog for a half hour or so when the dog went up and over a hill, which happened to be an area where you could see the field where my parents' house sat. When my brother and Joe got to the hill the dog created, they saw my parents' place, but the dog was nowhere in sight. I mentioned to them the old folklore of the black dogs, which are usually a sign of the devil in the UK but have also been thought of as benevolent spirits of the woods. Neither of them had ever heard of what I said, and they said their hair on their arms stood straight up. I'm from a small village in the north of Iran, up in a mountain area surrounded by large forests. The story is from two years ago, when I was 18, 2021. It was a partly cloudy day, and I was going to go for a walk in the forest like every day. The main path of the forest crosses from behind our house, so it wasn't like a long walk, but it was just deep in the forest, a dirt road with trees around you as far as the eye can see. It was kind of late compared to usual, it was around 5.30 or 6 p.m., and it was getting dark, but because I was familiar with the path, I wasn't worried, and thinking I would be back soon made me just go for it. I was about 20 minutes into the walk, and it just kept getting darker every minute. I got to a part of the path that is straight, like 1,000 feet, and you can see the end of it, and as I was slowly walking on that road like dusk, I wasn't sure what I'm looking at, especially in that distance. My first thought was that it's probably a cow, 
It's a village, so many people have farms around here, and sometimes they let their cows in the woods for days, but in like a large group, but I thought then why this one is alone, and most importantly, why it's not moving. Believe it or not, I don't know why, but I didn't stop. It was the curiosity, maybe, or I just didn't want to be a pussycat if it's a prank or some guy from the village. I don't really know what I was thinking in that moment. I just remember looking at the thing without a blink as I was walking towards it. The thing that creeped me out the most was why the hell this thing doesn't move an inch. I was just getting more and more scared as I got closer to it. I started to see a shape, it was a tall figure with long and skinny legs. At one point, I think I saw a third leg or maybe a stick in his hands. I don't know exactly, it was so blurry. I kept walking, and, still not knowing what I was looking at, my heart was just coming out of my mouth. I stopped at maybe 60 feet of the figure, just looking at it was just coming out of my mouth. I stopped at maybe 60 feet of the figure, just looking at it standing still without a single move or anything. I didn't have the courage to see anything, I remember just thinking, duck it. I turned around and walked away. As I was walking back, I constantly looked back at my shoulder, paranoid of seeing that thing move, but every time it was just standing there and just kept getting further away and finally out of sight. It was almost completely dark at this point. After a few turns, I calmed down a little bit. I wasn't worried that much. I didn't run home like crazy, keep walking normally, and try not to think about what just happened. I just started working with my phone to maybe call a friend to just talk with them until I got home. And just before that, for the last time, I looked back, something I wish I had never done. I saw something that traumatized me for life and still makes my hand shake from fear to this day. I saw the same blurred black figure, standing still. In the middle of the road, looking at me from like 50 feet, I didn't stand there to see if it moved or not this time. I just ran for my life, I ran like if I stopped, I would die, I didn't look at my back, I just ran home. When I got home, my hands and feet were shaking, something that I had never experienced and that I hope I never do again. My family was worried too. After I told them what just happened, they told me I was hallucinating, but I could tell from their eyes that they were shocked and scared. I never experienced such a thing again and never mentioned it with anyone until today, but this experience will forever be in my mind and hunt me forever. So it was last night at about 1 o'clock. I think I always keep my dog sleeping in my room, but on late nights she wants out. I remember opening the door from my bedroom, and for some strange reason, I looked up at my right and saw a huge figure. It was touching the ceiling, and it had thin black hair. Its face was like a doll, but at the same time, it looked like skin yet porcelain. It also wore a long black robe with a hood. It hid everything but its face and a few strands of robe with a hood. It hid everything but its face and a few strands of hair. At the same time, I remember freaking out, but I just said hell nah and closed the door, immediately keeping my dog inside with me. After a while, I laid down to sleep, but I felt like I was being watched. I wanna say it was hallucination since I was up late that night and yesterday, but it was just so unsettling in there that I knew it wasn't. The year was 2009. I stayed by myself at my then boyfriend's parents building, which was in front of their house in rural NC. It was late at night, and I smoked a cigarette. Then I saw a red light moving quite far from me, but not too far away. I wasn't sure what it was, so I went back inside. As I stood at the door, I saw a white light moving around the bed. It was like a flashlight, only that there wasn't one. I decided to turn off the light, and right in front of me, I saw a blurred orb. The color was like the ones you see in photos of blue orbs. It was moving lightly, but I was completely aware of my presence. I freaked out, turned on the light, and slept in the bigger house that night. I didn't even know the word orb back then, only a few years later, I've learned that it was a thing. Three years ago, I lived in Rockwood and had a lot of experiences in the house we lived in. I believe there were multiple ghosts in that house, and for the most part, they were completely harmless. I just wanted attention, which I tried not to give them so I wouldn't give them reason to act up more. This included a magazine being launched several feet off the kitchen bar when I was home alone, things disappearing and reappearing in weird places sometimes years later, my mother believes there was a poltergeist like being doing this particular thing, and my bedroom door vibrating when there was no draft, AC running, or train going by. There were also times when I would catch glimpses of them. I think the ghosts were from very long ago, as I caught sight of just a waistcoat floating in front of a table we had pictures of late relatives on. Another time, I saw a shadow that resembled a man sitting in a chair outside my hallway. He just seemed to be casually sitting there. And I am very certain my great-grandmother and great-aunt would both pop in on occasion to comfort or be jokesters. However, there was also a presence that I never saw but could feel. I don't believe it was evil, but I was just very angry. 
In what was my office those last few years, I would often feel like I was being glared at and had the overwhelming feeling to leave. We were told the previous owner's mother did not die in the house, but given this spirit's anger and the numerous other things about the house that they lied to us about, we very much believe she died there in one of the rooms in that hallway. My brother also had lots of weird experiences in those rooms in the years before he moved out. I didn't believe in ghosts until a few years before I left that house, always shrugging weird things off, but I began escalating to the point where I could no longer ignore them. That ghost did eventually concede. I told the ghost I wanted nothing to do with them, that it was my space, and if they were not of love and light, they were not welcome in it. After that, I rarely, if ever, felt that angry spirit again. Outside of that home, I also had weird experiences in the woods of Sunbright while camping and hiking. There were certain areas where I would walk in and just know I needed to leave immediately. This was before I believed in ghosts, but I've grown up being outdoors and have always known that if your instincts tell you not to be somewhere, you need to go. I figured at the time that I'd picked up on hints at a bear or something in the area, and my nerves put it together before my mind could focus on it. This was in Cookville, so not quite ETN, but I went to a Halloween party a few years ago, and at this point I had accepted and started tapping into the paranormal side more than just for fun because I was a goth kid. It was a full moon, and this small group of people, maybe six, went outside to look at it. The group was made up of my brother and a handful of his friends at one of their apartments. Across the street was a cemetery. One of the other people was very into the paranormal, so I expected some ghost talk and maybe going to the cemetery. What I didn't expect was to feel an overwhelming presence watching us from the end of the building, which was shrouded in darkness and farthest from the cemetery. I didn't say anything to anyone, but I kept looking over my shoulder at the corner and fully expected to see someone each time. My brother asked me about it when we got back to his place and said he knew something had tripped me off. He's dealt with my anxiety for many years and knows when something has set me off, even when I don't voice it or have obvious signs showing. Whatever it was did not feel friendly, and I never went back. While I do still have occasional encounters, I have had nowhere near the activity that I did living in Roan County. I have since learned that the Rockwood, Harriman, and Kingston areas are very well known for being particularly haunted. There was a lot of witchcraft in the area back in the day that people attribute it to. I, however, believe my house was especially haunted because there were two cemeteries within a mile of either side of our street and many more in the area. I don't enjoy encounters and don't really want anything to do with any more ghosts to the extent of it being daily like it was there. But I will never forget the encounters I had in that house. About 20 years ago, an old friend of mine went to see the Gurdon Lights in Arkansas. We'd been warned not to bang on the railroad tracks, but we did anyway, of course. We started seeing the flicker after we had crossed the fifth trestle, and the further we went, the more it intensified in both size and frequency of occurrence. At the beginning of the fifth trestle, it sort of stopped, so we began splitting rocks against the tracks and calling out into the night. We heard a tree groan and crash down into a nearby creek, and then a blue light appeared in the distance and appeared to start coming at us. Or maybe just growing? It was terrifying, and we fled in the opposite direction until we got back to the car. I swear that all of this happened. I live on a native reserve called Aquasasne. I don't know if it's well known or not, but a quick online search will tell you the basics, so let's get into this. I, 18, once went out on the boat with my father, his sister, her kids, and their father in the street. Lawrence River, and there was, I guess you could call it, an urban legend. About the seaweed at the bottom of that river, it said that bad men would be dragged under by these creatures that disguise themselves as the rest of the weeds, and while I was on this outing, I jumped in the river alone, I was like 7 to 10, and it wasn't uncommon for me to swim alone, and when I jumped, I remember looking down at the bottom of the river, and the weeds were about 50 or so feet below me, pretty far in a river, and as I swam back up to the surface of the water, I felt something grab my leg, and I looked down, and it was the weeds, one like a strand just wrapped around my right ankle. I remember the light fading away, then I blacked out, and when I came to, my uncle was giving my CPR while my father was crying in his sister's arms, he was scared of losing me as we lost my older sister when I was three. That's all I remember from that particular day. No one talks about trauma here because it's considered to all be in our heads. Another time that didn't happen to me, it happened to one of my uncles. He was out on a sea in the rain when he saw a literal giant ass snake head, and he hit it, and this thing was impossibly huge, bigger than a car. Needless to say, I never swim alone anymore, and he doesn't go on the river in the rain. This happened 8 years ago, almost to the day. I was living in one city and working in another city about 20 minutes away. Since then, the areas between them have been hugely developed. But at the time, 
Everything between these cities was just undeveloped back roads with nothing around. No buildings, no sidewalks. No lights. Just rough old roads until you get into the other city. To get to work on time, I had to leave my house at 3.30 am one morning, I jolted awake at 3.20 full of adrenaline as I realized I only had 10 minutes to get myself ready and set my dog up to be alone while I was at work. Needless to say, the circumstances had me highly alert, rushing, and focused. Also, I was driving a lot faster. I drive down this road every day as I go to work. I usually take that time to wake up, but this time, I was wide awake. All I could think about was what would happen if I ended up being late. I was really anxious. Suddenly, my headlights shone on something in the distance ahead of me. What I saw was a naked, skinless man crossing the road on foot. When I say skinless, imagine those diagrams in your life science classes, where everything beneath the skin is revealed and intact, except in this case, with a shiny or wet appearance and bright pinks and reds all over. Like a living, skinless person. No clothes, no shoes, and, notably, appearing oddly content. He seemed strangely at ease considering he was crossing the road into nothingness in front of a speeding car in the dark at 3.45 am. There was no walking space suitable for humans out there, for miles. The area he was walking into was pitch black, there was nothing there but weeds and rocks. Where was he coming from? The same. No light, nowhere to roam, nothing. Was I tripping or what? I was sober and super awake. A former co-worker of mine told me a story about driving north of Gallup one night and seeing a woman dancing by the side of the road, but he didn't realize what he'd seen until he was past the curve where he'd seen her. He said he then remembered watching her do this whole dance routine and that it seemed like he had been watching for a long time, way longer than it would have taken to have driven past the place where he allegedly saw her. He wondered if he'd fallen asleep while driving. He said it was terrifying, and he floored it for the rest of his drive, trying to figure out if he was awake or had accidentally taken a drug or something. I don't really believe in paranormal stuff, but it was kind of a freaky story. When I was six years old, about to turn seven, my mom's side of the family went to Arkansas for the summer. It was a two-week vacation. At some point on the road, we had to stop at a cabin motel. The aunts and uncles went into their own separate rooms, and my cousin Ashley and I went to our own room in the cabin and got separate beds. It was a small room, and the door leading to the lobby was just a few feet away from us. The day fell and night eventually came, so we were both ready to go to sleep for the first night at the cabin. My cousin turned off the only lamp in the room, which I was not used to because at that age I slept with a night light, so I was trying to get settled, and I eventually fell asleep from what I could remember. Here's where things get strange. I remember eventually waking up, and I mean wide awake, because I couldn't sleep. So I sat up in bed. As soon as I sat up, I saw a green, fog-like smoke coming from the door that led to the outside, yet it was closed. The smoke was hovering in mid-air near the door, almost like a poisonous, toxic chemical that glowed neon green. I then noticed Ashley wasn't asleep but was playing on her Game Boy with the volume turned off. I turned to her and said, do you see that green fog over there? Her exact response to me was, what green fog? I don't see anything. I tried to convince her to look at the door or across the room, but she told me, there is no green fog, maybe you're just imagining things. But I was wide awake and knew it was there, that I could see it myself. You know that feeling that you were definitely wide awake and not just dreaming and that you knew your eyes were completely open? There is a distinct difference between dreaming you are awake and actually being awake, although there are some who cannot tell which. Little kid me knew in my heart up and down that I was wide awake and did in fact witness what I just saw. But I didn't panic completely about it. Instead, like the little girl I was, I hid under the covers, feeling very nervous, and my brain figured that if I slept, then the fog would go away. And I was right. The next morning I woke up to a completely normal morning, and I remember trying to tell everybody at the cabin at breakfast how I saw green fog in my room. But again, nobody believed a little kid's truths and instead rid them off as make-believe. To this day, I know what I saw, and I still tell some of my family members and friends about it. The weird thing is that people back then who disagreed with me now agree with me. Maybe their opinion on strange occurrences changed? I'll never know. They say that very young kids have a higher spiritual vision than half of the adult population. I believe that to be very true. So a couple nights ago, I decided to sneak out of my house to hang out with two other friends. It wasn't anything illegal, it was more just lurking around and having fun. It was about 9.50 or so when we all decided we should probably go back inside before I got caught with my parents. And one of my two friends needed to go back home since she was visiting my other friend in the neighborhood. As I was walking back home, everything seemed normal. I live by a middle school, 
and the front of it is practically in my backyard. So when we snuck out, we decided to go in the back of the middle school onto their soccer field. And this wasn't a lengthy process considering me and my friend lived on the same block. But as I was walking through my backyard to my garage to open it, I heard this noise. It didn't sound like anything concerning the first time, but when it happened again, I started to get a gross gut feeling. It had almost sounded like a hoarse scream, like something barely screaming. I had heard it two more times and then looked down my street. I had seen it. I saw what was screaming, it was this white mass running from house to house. I could have just been tweaking, but I wasn't on any kind of drug or anything. It wasn't that type of hanging out. As soon as I got inside, I called my two friends and told them to get inside immediately. They said they had also heard the same screaming, but a lot louder and stronger from where they were. When I heard it, I was in front of my house, and my whole neighborhood basically connects to the middle school, so when they were on the field, the other side of the field was all houses and the end of my street. I had them run to my backyard and stay out there until my friend's mom came and picked them up and took them home. Is this some sort of weird phenomenon or a creature? Someone help, it's been on my mind for the past five days. I live in South Mills, North Carolina. Right along the Great Dismal Swamp and all the creepy shit that's happened in there over the past 200 years. So, once or twice while I was sitting on the back stairs or staring out my window, I'd seen some strange things show up in the dim backyard light. Exhibit A, straight up being watched, so, once I was taking trash out to the tree line, we put the trash cans back there so the mice and cats don't get too close to the house, and as I threw the bag into one of the cans, something caught my eye. I shine my flashlight at it, and I see a humanoid shape dart further into the woods. I then saw its beady little glowing eyes staring ominously back at me as it peeked from behind a tree. When I shouted at it, it gtfo ed, and to be honest, I'm glad. Exhibit B, we probably have ghosts out here. As I stated before, I live along the Great Dismal Swamp, and anybody who takes a quick glance at the Wikipedia page will find out that escaped slaves use this as a route. In my three years living in this house, I've heard phantom footsteps and voices that do not belong to my family, and I have had one of the halo figures on my shelf fall over for no reason. That's all I've got. If anybody can help explain some of this stuff, it would be greatly appreciated. So to start, this happened when I was 18, and I am currently 33. I grew up in a rural area of Kentucky, and I lived next to the senator of Kentucky, who had bought our neighborhood when it was all just old farmland and woods, she was quite old and still alive today as well. So she had bought this land back in the 1970s, before she was the senator, and she had a lot of money from her parents. That was just a little backstory to understand as to why and how I lived next to her. When I was 18, my yard had backed up to the senator's house, and I worked her farmland and did chores around her land just to make some extra cash in the summer. The senator had massive amounts of land still that backed up into unused public land that went for miles and miles. Mainly tiny streams, fields, and trees, nothing too exciting. It was next to a small highway, and we had to cross it to get to the next part of the woods. My friend, whom we will call Auntie, also did the chores and land work, and he had a little brother as well, whom we will call Willie, and he was about 15. We all grew up in an area that was pretty safe, so our parents let us do whatever we wanted and just be back at a decent time. We often explored these lands during the day to see how far we could go or even find anything in the woods that would be pretty cool to explore. Usually we found nothing, some makeshift campsites for what we assumed was hunting and just camping. One day we went pretty close to dusk, and we happened to bring flashlights just in case it got too dark. This was during the fall of 2008, and the leaves were falling, and it was coating the ground pretty thick with leaves. As we were walking, I started to notice we had been going in a circle, and I assumed we were lost, and we could no longer hear the highway that was close to us. The sun was going down pretty quick, and we only had maybe about an hour left of light. It eventually got dark, and we started walking around in the woods with our flashlights. It quickly got darker and darker, and it was around 10 p.m. at this time, and we were still lost. Before anyone asks why we didn't call with our cell phones, I grew up in a relatively modest life, and my parents only gave me a flip phone, and service back then was shit. Throughout the night, we were trying our best to find the way we came, but it was near impossible in the dark, in very thick woods. My dad always told me that when in the woods, if it became extremely quiet at any point, that meant there was a much larger predator in the area. Now mind you, we are technically in the Appalachia area, and we have all heard the stories of what not to do while in the woods, specifically at night. Auntie, Willie, and I were walking, and suddenly everything in the area got extremely quiet, except for one noise, and that was whistling. We all stopped dead in our tracks and began to look around in every direction in an attempt to verify where it was coming from. Unknowingly, Annie whistled back, 
and we all know you are not supposed to whistle back in the woods, especially at night, in the Appalachian regions of the world. I hit Andy with my hand and told him, why would you do that? And the whistling started to grow louder and louder, so I told everyone to start running. As we were running, the whistling got softer and softer, and eventually it went away. If we weren't lost before, we are now. As we are wandering around, it's around midnight now, and it's a full moon, which is lighting the area somewhat well. We happened to walk up on a shanty, an old rundown shack. It looked like it still had somewhat of a door on it, and through the door, we could see a small fire going. As any dumb white person would do, we opened the door and asked if anyone was around. At that moment, we heard leaves crunching, and we all turned around, and nothing was there. As if it were a horror movie, the whistling started again, and it sounded like it was right next to us. We all turned towards the sound, and there she was, a woman in torn-up clothing with a really crappy appearance. She was about five feet from us. We slightly shifted back, and we just looked at her with the flash lights pointing at her. We said, hello? As if something we said made her lose her mind, she began screaming extremely loud. This wasn't normal screaming, it was primal. She lunged at Auntie, and out of reaction, Annie swung his flash light directly into the lady's face, and she fell to the ground. We started to run because we were terrified, and she began to chase after us while still screaming. I assume this lady had to be on drugs because she was extremely fast and pain did nothing to her, or she was just batshit insane, we are hauling ass through the woods for at least 15 minutes, and she is still chasing us, we eventually lose her, so we thought. We took a break behind some bushes, and we started hearing the whistling again. We sat there for at least an hour before we worked up the courage to keep running. We started running, and we could hear someone close to us running as well. No longer did we hear the whistling, but we only assumed she was near us. We started to hear the highway again, and we finally got to the highway. Assuming she was still chasing us, we got as close as we could to the highway and flagged someone down. We were terrified, she was waiting in the woods and was frantically waving people down, and the cars were scarce. No one stopped. Finally, someone stopped and let us in. He was pretty spooked because our faces were extremely pale, and he asked what had happened. We explained, and he told us that a lot of homeless, mentally incompetent people, and drug users live in these woods. He took us home, and we never entered that place again. And that was the day I shit my pants running. A couple of years ago, I was hanging out with my mom and having drinks in our garage. We decided to go to our local liquor store to get another pack of beers. It was around 7 or 8 p.m. on our way back into our cul-de-sac, about three houses down from ours, we saw what looked like a cloud but was only 20 to 30 feet off the ground. It was on the right-hand side of the street, near our neighbor's tree. Mind you, it was a clear night with no other clouds in the sky. It was kind of small, maybe three feet by three feet, hazy around the edges, and seemed to have a bright light coming from within it. It legit looked like it was daytime in the cloud, but it was dark out. We were mid-conversation when we both stopped and just stared at it. I slowed the truck until we stopped about 10 feet away. Without looking away, I asked my mom if she was seeing this thing too. As soon as she said yes, the cloud started floating across the street to the left-hand side. I started driving forward to see where it was going, but as soon as it got to the left-hand side of the street, where my other neighbor had a tree, it vanished. I quickly pulled up to my house, parked my truck in the driveway, and we both ran to investigate, but it was completely gone. We were so weirded out because we've never seen anything like that. It was also strange that it seemed to have reacted to us talking about it and acknowledging that we were indeed seeing this strange cloud because it started moving as soon as we started talking about it. It also looked like it was trying to hide because the neighbor's tree on our left-hand side had more leaves than the tree from our other neighbors on our right-hand side. The light coming from within this cloud was so bright that it seemed like it was daytime inside of it. It was as if we could see something inside of it, like soft shapes, but it was hard to make out since it was bright. Every time my mom and I talk about it and try to find some type of explanation, we end up asking ourselves if what we saw that night was some type of portal. What are your thoughts? I've tried looking it up to see if anyone else has ever seen something similar, but I never find anything. I guess I'm just curious to know what it was and why it moved and disappeared the way that it did. When I was younger, I'd say 15 or 16, I'm almost convinced I came face to face with something evil in a dream. My parents are divorced and have been for a long time now, and I'd go back and forth between their care and that of my sister. My mom's house was always fine, but my dad's basement apartment had this weird oppressive atmosphere I couldn't shake and the woman he was renting from who lived above was incredibly strange. I'd hear organ music or a weird droning from upstairs past midnight regularly, and there were always people coming in and out of her house. I'd had weird dreams and nightmares at my dad's place before, but this was something else. 
what I am about to describe to you still raises the hair on my arms, even now that many years have passed. The dream began with what I thought at the time was me waking up in a cold sweat from another nightmare, and the apartment was dead silent. This was weird to me because when I looked at the clock by my bedside, it was only a bit past midnight, and my father was usually up playing guitar or on the computer at that time. This was my first sign something wasn't right, my second was when I looked at the floor of my room and found something odd. The light filtering in from outside through my window was a bright red. I became aware of a panting noise then and looked over to where my bedroom door was slightly ajar, seeing the same red light coming from behind it. I felt myself stiffen in fear, and I couldn't move as I watched my door open further, pushed by the snout of a large black dog that walked in and stood by my bedside. The dog had shining white eyes and appeared to be half wolf, its tongue hung out of its mouth and dripped saliva as it looked at me. In an expressionless baritone voice, that dog spoke directly into my head and said, I am the devil. Follow me. What I mean by this is that the dog's jaw never moved while communicating this to me, I just looked into its eyes, and those words came to me. I felt a compulsion to leave the bed and follow, even though I was terrified, so I stood and walked behind the black dog as it left my room and entered the kitchen slash dining room. As we left my room, I felt my stomach twist as the air temperature noticeably dropped. My mom and dad, who weren't speaking at the time, along with my sister, my stepfather, and my stepmother, who had never met, were all seated at the dinner table, facing each other wordlessly with empty plates in front of them. The light above the dinner table bathed them all in the same red light that streamed through the window in my bedroom. The black dog turned to face me and said, Welcome to hell, while everybody at the table did the same with blank, expressionless faces. At that point, I woke up for real and discovered the time was actually 3 a.m. It's safe to say I didn't sleep for the rest of that night and didn't tell anyone about that nightmare until almost a month after I had it. My sister passed away in 2015. She was on life support for a couple weeks and didn't have any brain function, so we let her go. I was so angry and distraught that I cursed God. I've always believed in God, everyone is entitled to their own beliefs, I will never bash anyone or shove God down their throat, this was just my belief in my heart. I cursed God. I told him I wasn't following him anymore. I didn't believe in him anymore, and if he was real, he wasn't anyone I wanted to worship or pray to. I renounced him in my heart, and I meant it. No sooner were these words out of my mouth that I felt everything change. Immediately and suddenly. Like a light switch. Boom. I just felt the energy around me totally change. I left my uncle's and was walking to my grandma, maybe 300 yards away. It was winter and dark. Walking to my grandma, I could hear something walking behind me. I could hear the snow crunching. My tracks were the only tracks left. It spooked me, and I ran to my grandma. That night, I began to have sleep paralysis. Literally that night. I woke up and couldn't move. I could only look around. The TV was on and cast a light in the room. I couldn't see anything, but I could sense something. Something was there, and it wasn't good. And I fought like hell to wake up. This went on almost nightly for two months. I would wake up and sense something. Eventually, it turned into seeing this super tall shadow dude in the corner. Every time this happened, it would get closer. Progressively. One night I woke up and sensed that feeling, and on the right of me standing over top of me was the shadow man. He was so tall that he stretched across the ceiling. He has to slouch to stand in my room. I would try so hard to wake up. To scream, kick, or anything. This got so bad that I was afraid to sleep at night. I knew what would happen. I would have experiences where I would see the shadow man and fight to wake up. Wake up and get out of bed, go into the kitchen for a drink, and I would sense that energy again behind me and fight, fight, fight to just wake up in bed again. Like I never really woke up the first time. Dreams are dreams. The last time I saw the shadow, I woke up to see him in the hallway outside my door. He crouched to walk into my room and stepped onto my bed like a stair. And he walked on my bed to stand over top of me. Fighting like hell to wake up waking up and being afraid to go back to sleep. The last time I felt that energy, I was dreaming. I had a dream of my sister. We were in my bathroom with the door shut and the lights on. I could even see my own reflection and that of my sister's in the mirror. It felt so real. This was the only dream I have had of my sister, and she was just standing with me, and I felt that energy again. Right outside the bathroom door. And I tried to say, go away, get out, but I couldn't say anything. I couldn't speak, and my sister said, it's okay, dude, and she put her hand on my shoulder and said, go away, when she said it, I could start to say, go away. It was really quiet, and I spoke that over and over, gaining volume each time, until I was screaming, go away, and I felt the energy leave. My sister hugged me, and I woke up. 
That was literally the last time I ever experienced the shadow man. I don't have any doubt that I invited something very evil into my world. It was slowly coming for my soul, and my sister saved me. It was 2009-ish. I was living on the road for two years, hitchhiking and riding trains. I was a dumb 18-19 year old. I had been all over the country, the west coast multiple times, the southwest, and decided to see the east coast. I went to Florida and went to a small festival there. It's called a rainbow gathering, they're kind of like big meetups of traveler kids, old hippies, tramps, and those kinds of people. They're always in state parks or national parks. Rangers will patrol it, and police sometimes show up, but for some reason it's allowed. I'm not sure how, but these have been going on since the 1970s, I think. Some people who show up are hardcore train hoppers and gutter punk types, and some are super chill Christians who will wash your feet. It's a very unusual festival. There are smaller regional gatherings and a big national gathering where thousands of people show up. Kind of the poor man's burning man. Huge fire pits get dug out, elaborate latrines, hundreds of drum circles, free food is constantly made from kitchens, which are just camps devoted to making food for all us bums. Well, I met some friends at a smaller regional one in Florida, and we parted ways, never thinking I was going to see them again. One was named Anna, and we sort of hit it off. I hitchhiked north all the way to upstate New York when I caught wind of the national gathering, which was going to be in Pennsylvania. I figured I might as well go. I got to this gathering early, in the Allegheny National Park, and helped set up, trying to meet people, kind of looking for my group, not sure where I was going to be camping. One day I ran into Anna, whom I had met in Florida. Me and her had some spiritual conversations in Florida, talking about fairies and UFOs. She had some unusual stuff happen to her when she was a kid. So she and her buddy had just gotten to PA, and we decided the three of us were going to team up. We noticed a ton of people showing up to this thing, it was getting really crowded, so we decided to move camp to a more remote area. We chose a spot off of the main trail, which goes from the parking lot to the gathering. It's a couple miles long, and there's a lot of foot traffic going up and down and people going in and out of the festival, but we had some space. This happened around dusk. Me and Anna were sitting by our little twig fire, stone cold sober. Alcohol isn't really allowed at a gathering, it does still get in, but there's a camp at the parking lot called A Camp where all the drinkers stay. There's, of course, other drug use at these festivals, but me, Anna, and her friend just weren't into the whole drum circle scene. We had just gotten done having a deep talk about spirituality when we started to feel hungry and stood up to start heading down to the main circle, which is where everyone can get one big meal a day. We're standing up when Anna says, hey, do you hear that? And I say, no and I just keep putting out the fire with my foot, and she says, no, hey, shh, listen, so I stop, and I can hear the sound of someone walking through the forest. The thing that was weird about it was that it was coming from a direction where there was no festival. So the festival was down below us, about a half mile if we were looking down the trail, and this sound was coming from our left, where it's just hundreds of miles of Pennsylvania woods. The parking lot is way up the trail, a few miles behind us. It was odd because it sounded like a person speed walking towards us. I didn't think deer because they wouldn't be coming up to a fire pit, I genuinely thought it was just some lost hippie. As this sound was getting closer, there were some people walking down the trail and some walking up the trail. There's a weird custom called Nick at night. If you yell Nick at night, a dude with a tin can full of tobacco will come find you and roll you a cigarette. There are about 10 of them walking around, and their sole job is to maintain everyone's nicotine habit. They get a ton of donations from A Camp. So anyway, these two groups ran into a Nick at night, kid, and now we are all standing together on the main trail, talking about 10 meters below us, oblivious to us. So while that's happening to our right and below us, this sound of someone walking from our left has gotten so close that we should be seeing who or what it was, and there just wasn't anything there. I was frozen, kind of stuck in a state of confusion, and I think Anna was too. No fear, just why aren't we seeing it? We could visibly see leaves and dirt being kicked up, like there was an invisible person walking by. Whatever it was, it went right up to that group of people on the main trail and didn't stop, but it slowed down like it was checking them out. They were totally oblivious to this, they were all smoking, talking, and laughing. It kind of did a turn as it went up to them and then suddenly made a straight line towards me and Anna. Anna had a keychain with a million things on it, and she was frantically looking for this mini flashlight she had on it. It was dusk, so not bright out, but still light enough that we could see the footfalls and debris being kicked up. My mind was thinking there's a squirrel or a field mouse hopping on the forest floor or something. The forest floor was covered in dead leaves, but these steps were quick, as if this were a child or a small person walking fast. 
It's hard to explain in writing. This thing came right up to us. I'm standing to the right of our smoldering fire, and Anna is to the left. I could hear her just struggling with this keychain. It came right up to me, probably five or six feet away. There was nothing there. It did the same thing with the group, it slowed its pace like it was checking us out, like a slow trot. As it went by, Anna said hey and showed the light where it was, there was nothing to see, and whatever this thing was took off up the hill. It just absolutely took off, it was so fast. The footfalls became like a machine gun. If I had wanted to run after it, I couldn't have. A second later, me and Anna took off running in the opposite direction, past that group, and just kept going till we were at the bottom. Funny thing happened, there's people at these gatherings who spend the whole month naked, they'll roll around in mud and just look like mud people for the whole festival. One of these people we had seen around was this seven-foot giant of a man, probably 400 pounds, naked, covered in mud and leaves. Me and Anna are in full flight mode, and at this point it's dark, and we run right into this guy. He scared us so bad, Anna screamed, and we all started laughing, and that sort of cancelled out the panic. We went to go find our other friend, and it was weird because Anna was very scared, she kept saying it was because of her, like she had a weird fairy slash alien situation happen to her as a kid with her mom, and she felt like whatever this was was because of her. I don't know, but she did not want to talk about it after, and I could never get her to elaborate. Me and this other friend were all about it, we went back up there, Anna said she wasn't going and wanted us to pack up the tent, and we sort of hung out, tried to look for tracks with our lights, listened, and nothing happened. I've gone from thinking it was an alien, like a grey, to a ghost. Or maybe a fairy or a gnome. One person said it could have been a pukwudgie. These are like Native American gnome things that are tricksters and can turn invisible. They are supposed to be in that area. So I don't know. The Stolen Generation, also known as Stolen Children, were the children of predominantly Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander descent who were removed from their families by the Australian federal and state government agencies and church missions under acts of their respective parliaments. The removals occurred in the period between approximately 1905 and 1969, although in some places children were still being taken until the 1970s. My Nana, who is Aboriginal, was, as a child, removed from her family and relocated to a mission outside Katanning, Western Australia. I am not 100%, but mental math indicates this happened to my Nana in the middle 1960s, it's very disrespectful to ask an Aboriginal family member their age, so it's as close as I can get. The mission's name was Maribank, and it was run by nuns at the time. Even though the Stolen Generation was a federal government initiative, pretty much when the children were removed and relocated to these missions, that's where the government's influence stopped and the church was left to manage it. Aboriginal tradition and customs were something that was somewhat respected, but the nuns were very strict and often cruel, and the pursuit of religious studies was very strictly enforced. As such, any activity that was culturally paranormal while experienced by the resident Aboriginals was something overlooked and disregarded by the nuns. Either their being non-Aboriginal meant they were not affected or targeted by the Aboriginal paranormal, or their blind religious beliefs meant that, on top of being white, they additionally ignored anything untoward. This is pure speculation by me after growing up and listening to stories my whole life. Okay, so that's the background finished. Here is the story as told to me by my black Nana and her sister Tilly. Maribank was located near a stream, and occasionally there were tribe meetings located at an aside part of the stream, which is about 1.5 kilometers from the Maribank mission. On an otherwise normal day, an Aboriginal elder who no one recognized emerged from the bush and declared that there was to be a meeting at the stream and for all the Aboriginal elders and male children to go to the meeting place immediately. You see, women and female children are not allowed to attend or speak at meetings, so they all remained behind at Maribank. So all the men left, and about 15 minutes after my black Nana noticed, all the wind stopped and every insect became absolutely silent. Black Nana ran to the nuns' quarters, but going through every room and searching around, she could find no sign of any nuns, even though, as she recalls, there were hot cups of tea and a kettle whistling on the wood stove. Black Nana returned to her sister, who was absolutely beside herself, and Tilly told Black Nana that she saw a few things that were very tall and skinny moving through the bush, but they were alternating between two and four legs, and that she wanted to go into the bush like she was drawn to it. Black Nana noticed that a few of the other girls had moved to the edge of the bush, and a few others had even gone out of sight, and that she could hear screaming and pleading for people to help them. The thing that Black Nana remembers most is that even with the screams of terror from just outside the visual range from all different directions, the girls who were near the edge seemed unable to hear them or be scared. It was then that Black Nana grabbed Tilly and dragged her and a few others that had remained back into the sleeping quarters. 
It was in the sleeping quarters that Black Nana started stuffing girls into cupboards and drawers, if they could fit, and into the large trunks at the end of the beds. Also, there was a manhole in the floor where you could access the underneath of the bunkhouse, which was used for storage, and Black Nana used it often to sleep and escape the cruelty of the nuns. It was under the floor that Black Nana and about 15 of the remainder of the girls hid, remained very quiet, and were hiding. At the same time that this was happening, the male aboriginal elders and male children were all arriving at the stream gathering and were awaiting the elder that had emerged from the bush and demanded the meeting. They were all just wandering around, throwing rocks, and entertaining themselves. It was then that it got deathly cold, and the stream just stopped, like time had slowed down. Everyone just looked at each other, and the largest feeling of dread fell over everyone. It was also at this time that dozens and dozens of small birds called woolly wagtails arrived and all landed between all the men and just stayed in place, wiggling their tails. It was then that the elders realized everything was really wrong and that the camp was completely unprotected, and the women and female children were all alone. It was then that they started running to camp. Back at camp, Black Nana had secured the floor panel in place and was lying under the floor with many other girls, probably eight or nine years old, in the bunkhouse, hidden in cupboards, drawers, and trunks. Everyone became absolutely silent. Black Nana heard the sound of footsteps enter the room above, but she knew from her many nights sleeping under the floor that it was not normal, and she recalls that somehow she knew it was not human but somehow lighter and quicker as it moved around with directional sounds. She thought it stopped above, only to hear it make footsteps from another location far from there, like either it could move silently or that there was more than one. This continued what Black Nana remembers as being an eternity until she heard the shouts of the male elders returning from the stream in which she said she heard a flutter of footsteps and silence followed by the entry of the male elders making a lot of noise. After Black Nana and everyone came out of the floor and she located the other children she had hid away, it was found that seven girls were missing, and even the best trackers could not follow their trail more than a few feet from the edge of the bush. It was also then that all of the nuns were there and swore that they were all in the nuns' quarters just drinking tea and chatting around the kitchen table and only emerged after hearing the yelling and shouting of the male elders running through the bush back to camp. To this day, Black Nana is very upset by this and has many superstitions and routines for her every bedtime, regardless of her location. And that's all I know about that story.